This next speaker I'm very excited to introduce you to. His name is Jim Cathcart. He is a Hall of Fame speaker. Uh, he is one of the most celebrated, awarded, legendary speakers in all of the industry today. You can see he has tons of awards. He's spoken everywhere all across the globe. And uh, his knowledge is amazing. And I wanted no one other than him before we give you the instructions for tonight to close us out on a great note. So please just give a warm Thought Leader Summer welcome to Mr. Jim Cathcart. Afternoon. Thank you for that too. What we're going to talk about is how to build a career that you can sustain for decades. The reason I'm speaking on that is what I've done over the last 42 years is I've worked as a professional speaker and author. I started out as a kid training people in other people's methods. You know, I got Earl Nightingale's material and I taught that and sold his cassettes. Cassettes are kind of like CDs on little boxes. For, yeah. <laughs> Some people, they say, cassettes? What do we, hey, Grandpa, tell them what a cassette is, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I started out back in those days when you had to sell the concept of motivation and then the idea of adult learning before you could ever even consider getting a speech booking. Well, since that time, I've done 3,100 speeches all over the world and I've been the president of the National Speakers Association, that's what this little pin is, and I've had the opportunity to just live a life of unbelievably fortunate abundance. And I'm proud to be part of this book with Brian Tracy and my other co-authors there. You can see them on the left. And um, yeah, good for you, there you go. Let's, let's get hands up of those, those who are in the will to win. There they are. Thank you, great to be with you, proud to be associated with you. This is my company, Cathcart Institute. And you notice the logo is an acorn. And if you look at it closely, you'll also see that the acorn itself is in the shape of a C. And the person emerging triumphantly from the acorn is in the shape of a lowercase i, Cathcart Institute but it also captures the whole essence of what my company is about, what my whole idea is about. And I've got a hint for you, it's not about what's in this photo. When you ask the question of yourself, what is success? How do you answer it? I don't need to hear the answer, I, I just want you to think about your answer. What is success to you? What does it mean for you to truly succeed? Does it mean money? I mean, it's probably going to at some point, because if you don't have enough money, then money becomes your problem. Money is simply a tool to remove obstacles and give you access, right? If you see money that way, it's fine. If you see money as the thing you want, then you're thinking too shallow. And you could say, well, it, it, to me, it's, it's lifestyle. I want to you know, do wonderful things and go all over the world and have great experiences. Wonderful. But I think success is bigger than that, because that's just really self-indulgence on one level or another, okay? So when you think about success, I believe success, kind of like in, in uh, the comments Nick was doing earlier with the video clips, I think success is living the life you are divinely designed to live in such a way that it makes life better for everybody you touch in such a way that it makes life better for everybody you touch. And for that matter, why speak just to them, speak through them, make it everybody they touch as well. You see, the world all day, every day, is asking us one question. And that question is, what do you want? If it's a barista standing there waiting to get your order at the coffee shop, or you're sitting on Santa's knee, or you rub the bottle and the genie came out, they all want to know the same thing. When you call somebody, they pick up the phone and they say hello, which means, what do you want? Right? Who are you? What do you want? When you and I aren't clear on what we want, the world can't give it to us. So it gives somebody else what they want instead. The clearer we are on what we want, the greater the possibility of it coming to pass. Yes? Okay. 
the future you see, in other words, the dream you have of the future, tells you what kind of qualities you need to cultivate in you in order to get there. The future you see tells you the person you'll need to be. I learned long ago that the key to success or the path to success is to acquire the traits, the knowledge, the skills, the personal qualities of the person you would like to be. Now, if you become the person you'd like to be, here's the cool bonus. You get the life you'd like to live as a byproduct. If you become the person you'd like to be, you get the life you would like to live as a natural byproduct. And it's not a temporary win, it's something you can sustain because it's coming from who you really are. And by the way, all of these slides, every one of these slides is in a PDF document that will be emailed to all of you, so you don't have to worry about capturing this, and believe me, there's gonna be information overload in a minute or two, and you're gonna say, could you, could you go, no, I'm not gonna go back but I will send you all the slides, okay? So what if you don't expect much? Well, I didn't, and most people don't. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I live in California now, not far from here. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was um, one of two children. My dad was a telephone repairman. Mom was a housewife taking care of us, and my grandfather, who was an invalid, a complete invalid, couldn't move or speak or anything, from a stroke, and he was in our front bedroom for seven years. And I grew up with, a, with just a, basically a normal, ordinary, middle-class life. And I didn't expect much. I went to high school, and then I went to a couple years college, didn't excel as a student at any point along the spectrum. So I didn't expect much academically, wasn't an athlete, didn't expect much that way. I just didn't expect much. I thought I'd have a nice life, live to my statistical average for my gene pool, and then die to make room for whoever comes next. I honestly, that's what I thought. I just thought I'd be a nice guy and live an ordinary life. And then one day in 1972, when I was 52 pounds heavier than I am now, smoking two packs a day, 20, let's see, 72, I was 26 years old, I'm 70, I'll be 72 next week. I was, a, a, I was an assistant loan specialist at the Little Rock, Arkansas Housing Authority. Assistant to a man who was not busy. <laughs> Meaning I had nothing to do all day long. Urban Renewal Agency, and I sat there, I read books on urban renewal, didn't want to choose that path. Read the Bible cover to cover at work in a three month period. I had a lot of spare time. I had a wife who was working part-time and helping raise our new son. I had no money in the bank, no college degree, no reason to expect I was going to have an abundant life. But I thought I'd have a pretty good life, okay? Then one day in the next room, there was a radio playing, and it had a little five-minute show from Earl Nightingale, the dean of personal motivation, who was on nine hundred radio stations at that time around the world. He said, if you will spend one hour extra every day studying your chosen field, in five years or less, you'll be a national expert. I thought, wait a minute. Hour a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, five years, that's 1,250 hours. 1,250 hours on any subject would make a person a leading expert. Hmm, even I could do this. What do I want to be an expert at? Not urban renewal. And I kept thinking about it, and I didn't know. So it took a few weeks for it to sink in. Finally, it hit me. I want to do what he's doing. What who's doing? Earl Nightingale. I had no idea what that meant. All I knew was it felt deep down right to me. You know, it's like Jack and the others were saying on the videos earlier. What you want, what you genuinely, sincerely want, not just what you have a, a little uh, craving for, but what you deeply want is your DNA and your whatever, your essence telling you, hey, this is your way. Go toward this, right? So I felt that. I didn't understand it, but I felt it. 
And I said, I want to do what he's doing. So I wrote it down. In 1974, I wrote, I will be, in uh, September 1st, 1979, a national authority in the field of personal development. No idea what that meant. But I kept it in front of me every day. Over the next few years, I started studying personal development fanatically, and I mean fanatically. Um, sometimes three, four, five hours a day, entire weekends, you know, anybody that wanted to be involved in the field of success achievement, I wanted to get around them. And so my circle of friends changed and that fueled my growth. And five years later, I was a full-time speaker and trainer flying around the country, at first teaching other people's courses and then teaching my own. Today, I've written and published 19 books. And next week, I'm going to China for a 20-day lecture tour, my third this year. Who knew, right? Who knew this kind of stuff was possible? Most of us look at the stage door and say, oh, that's, I, I, you know, I don't belong, right? I think we need to get past that. We need to understand that there are possibilities waiting for us that we never suspected. My friend Dan Burris, he says, if you don't know what's possible, you're going to ask for too little. Isn't that the truth? So expect a lot more. What you expect determines what you're going to get a lot more of. Taylor Swift was born in 1989. In 2015, young Taylor Swift put together the 1989 World Tour, and it brought 2,278,000 people out and generated a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue. Was it because she's a good singer? Was it because she's a good songwriter? Was it because she's cute? <laughs> Why was she, how was she able to generate a massive money machine and, and enjoyment machine of that epic proportion? What drove it? Was it her parents? Studio mom, right? Was it that? When your dream really gets home with you, you know, it finds its little home and it settles in and it starts sending out roots and then it starts growing limbs and reaches out. The longer it's in there, the more you nurture it, the more you cultivate that dream and you say, okay, I don't see any way I can do it now, but that's my dream, I'm going for that, the more it becomes a reality. And your dreams, your poss let me correct that, your possibilities, are far greater than your thinking is. Your possibilities are far, far greater than you suspect they are. Would you think, would you say I'm telling you the truth? Yes. I certainly believe that, and I've, I've got a great deal of experience with myself and others to back it up. Your dreams are possibilities seeking to be expressed through you. That's a paraphrase of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, desire is possibility seeking expression. So we are the vehicle, we're the door, we're the, the portal through which these desires can become a reality and serve the world. And if we live a tiny little modest life, shame on us. Because look how much good we denied other people by doing so. So you can, every day, I mean, you can help people. You can smile at some of these street people out here when nobody else does. You can pick up a piece of trash. You can fix something that's broken. You can give an answer, provide direction. You can make the world a better place many times every day, everywhere you go, even when you're naked and afraid and have no resources at all. You can make the world a better place. And I believe we must. I believe it's our duty that is just ingrained in us, that's the job. And let me also make a comment. If you know how to reach your goal, it's not a goal. It's a to-do. If you don't know how to reach your goal, good for you. That's a great starting point. Because if the goal is truly a goal, 
It's going to inspire you to grow and let those headlights show you the next 100 yards or 100 feet of road, right? Sometimes, though, we think, gee, you know, the opportunity is way bigger than I am. So increase your success velocity so that you can reach it, for heaven's sakes. In other words, increase the intensity and speed with which you operate. Find ways to add to yourself the skills and traits that will make you more capable. And as you get to each turning point or each, each bend in the road, pause and think and reflect on what you just experienced. My friend Kevin Buck says this, and I think that's brilliant. Because if we don't stop at the end of today and reflect on the day and remember the things that impacted us, if we don't look back through our notes, if we don't go to our, our cell phone and look at those images we captured and think about what it means, then what happens is we get shelf help. Shelf help is what you get from the books you buy, read, and then put on a shelf, and you never change anything. Self-improvement comes from the implementation. And the implementation is only going to be stimulated when we stop to think about it and think, oh, finally I get, yeah, I, but duh, that was staring me in the face. Yeah, now I know what to do, right? So here's what I suggest all of us be as much as we can be. Proactive. In other words, don't just wait for opportunities. Poke them. <laughs> Stimulate them. Wake them up. Make something happen. Don't wait for it. Make it happen. Second, look at, the, look at your average day and just kind of list everything you did from the time you rolled out of bed, even what you thought about before you got out of bed. Everything you can remember from that day, write it down, and then ask yourself, writing beside it, was that intentional or just circumstantial? Did I do it that way because that's the way I've always done it, or is there a reason I do it that way? Why did I go there? What did I do? What, how did I fill this time? Was that intentional, or was that just what was there, right? And then be more intelligent about each of the things that you do. Because the higher percentage of intentionality in your day, the higher percentage of success in your day. And then be intelligent. Now, what does that mean? It means to notice more about it and think about it more deeply. I'm working with an outfit in, in New York right now called mentored.com. And we've created an online um, video training academy and the first course in it is now up and I arranged for them to allow one of those modules to be free to you so if you want to go to Cathcart RI which is relationship intelligence dot mentor dot com you can see one of those free modules in that and this is what you're going to encounter when you get into it it'll look like that it's a 12-week program you don't have to buy anything to do that, by the way. What I'm known for in some circles is the book and the concept relationship selling. And a lot of people say, oh, that's, that's be nice to people selling. No, it's not. It's looking at relationships as assets and man managing and measuring the metrics of each of your relationships. Looking at the early stage of a relationship, which might be just an encounter or a transaction, and then looking at the highest stage where it's a full-on partnership and the stages in between and being more intelligent about progressing each contact to the next stage throughout the process until you're surrounded by collaborators. I wrote that in 86, well, actually 85, and then I re rewrote it in 2002. And about that time, it was coming out um, with Putnam Berkeley, and I was at the Booksellers Expo, the American Booksellers Association Convention, and I was there with my publisher, and I was signing books and interviewing people, or being interviewed, and two of my friends, fellow speakers, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, came over and said, Jim, we've got this great idea for a new book. 
let's find a place to sit down. So my wife Paula and I went, we sat down, and they told us about this wonderful concept, chicken soup for the soul. And I thought it'd probably do pretty well. Yeah, 500 million books later. The essence of intelligence is noticing more, making distinctions. Any person could look at this wall and see that it's filled with tools, but most of us couldn't tell you what each of those tools is designed for. Someone who has taken the time to study each of those tools and knows their use can be really, really intelligent about how to use these resources. Somebody who has not will simply find it an interesting design and the tools will be useless to them. So in any situation where you feel a little challenged, notice more. Look for the patterns. Discover the principles that make things work. Just learn about one little pixel and then another, and pretty soon you've got a room full of tools. When I took a look at selling and writing that book, Relationship Selling, I said, let's take a look at the sales cycle, preparation, targeting the right people, connecting with them, assessing their needs, solving their problems, getting their commitment to buy, assuring they're satisfied, managing sales and managing yourself. Let's notice even more. In preparation, there's sales preparation, there's self-preparation. In sales preparation, there's internal and external. In self-preparation, there's mental and physical. Hmm, gee. When it comes to who you target and how you target them, that also breaks down. Same thing's true in connecting and assessing and solving and getting commitment and so forth. That's 32 skill sets within the eight stages in a sales cycle. So I wrote the book around 32 skill sets. And then I started creating a video series for each of those skill sets. And then I started creating online training that I started in one core content has turned out to be probably 15 or 25 different products, learning tools over the years. You can do that same thing. Take your basic idea, notice more, find the structure, study the patterns, discover the principles, and then repeat that in more eloquent ways through different media as many times as you can. And you'll reach a zillion people. By the way, when I need to write an article, for a sales publication, where do I start? Wherever I'd like to. There's 32 options right there staring me in the face. So I could say, uh, pick one at random. Choose one. Seriously, choose one of the, one of the major areas. Prepare, target, et cetera. Choose one of the major areas. Assure, OK. She chose Assure. Would you please, over here, would you please choose in Assure one of the other two, satisfied customers or loyal customers? Loyal customers, okay. Jim Shute, would you choose either upserving or recovery? Recovery. Recovering from problems or mistakes. I could write an article, so could you, right now, on what do you do when a customer's product doesn't function, when the delivery was late, when one of your people was rude, when you lost their order and it didn't get there on time, when the pricing was, was wrong on the invoice, how do you recover from that? See what I mean? The more you notice, the more you know, the more you know, the more options you see, and the person with the most options wins. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know, it's coming to you in the slides. <laughs> Tension and trust. Those two things are present in every relationship, every human contact you have, and always will be. There's two types of tension. There's task-related tension, getting the job done. Like a rock is on your foot, task-related tension is the need to get the rock off your foot. And there's relationship tension. That's where the other person's not so sure they should trust you. Task tension is easily resolved and it goes away forever. Relationship tension is not so easily resolved, but when you do resolve it, trust grows, because you can't control trust. You can't, it's the fruit of the plant. You can't make a plant produce fruit. You can nurture a plant, but it's in, in charge of whether it bears fruit, yes? Okay, so trust is the fruit. How do you get it? Remove tension. 
or causes of tension. In other words, dress appropriately to the setting. Use the language that's appropriate and respectful to the other person. Respect their time, show up. You know, all the things we'd obviously do if we're trying to connect with somebody in a professional way. When you control the variables, you control the tension level. When you control the tension level, you encourage trust. And when there's full trust between people, abundance flows. When trust is pure, abundance flows. Where I learned that, I was, now this is me at 72 next week, okay? Picture me at 22, just take 50 years off. <laughs> Lots of black hair, rosy cheeks, baby face. What I was doing at age 22 was repossessing log trucks in the Ozark Mountains. Honest truth, I was a field rep for GMAC. My job was to collect past due debts or get the vehicle back. So on a typical day, I was up around Mountain View, Arkansas, and on a typical day, I'd be back in the logging woods, and I'd drive my company car back there, bouncing along the ruts, and I'd, I'd see the truck I was looking for, and I'd park the car. Now, I've already called this guy a dozen times before, so if it's repo time, then he knows it's coming. So I parked my company car this one particular day, and I kind of swaggered over to the truck, trying to look bad, you know. And uh, this big hair-covered creature came down out of the truck. And I looked him in the chin. I said, I'm here to get your truck. He said, boy, I don't know if it's occurred to you yet. We're alone in the woods. I said, yes, sir. And he said, so if this comes down to a confrontation, I said, hey, not going to be one of those. He said, you're darn right it's not. Now go away and leave me alone. I said, okay. So I started to walk away. And this guy says, oh, no, I said to this guy, I said, uh, by the way, I'm the last nice guy they're going to send. <laughs> See ya. Hey, wait a minute. I said, what? Come here. That Set the gun down. <laughs> okay, so I went back over and I said, what? He said, what do you mean you're the last nice guy? I said, well, after me, it gets ugly. Because they send these big bruisers with guns and sheriffs. You know, it's not pretty. He said, well, what are my options? And I showed him his options. You know, pay a partial payment, pay a full payment, um, or give me the truck back, right? And he said, well, I don't have any money. Here threw the keys to me. I said, I don't know how to drive that truck. He said, not my problem. <laughs> I said, actually it is. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you live here. He said, what do you mean? I said, here in Mountain View. Yeah. I said, you, you go to town all the time. He said, of course I do. I said, you know the dealer who sold you the truck and you see him probably once or twice a week. He said, yeah. I said, well, if I take the truck and I go find someone who can drive it and we take it back to the dealer and I turn it in, next time you're in town, which would probably be, what, tomorrow, you're going to see the dealer and you're going to avert your eyes and walk on the other side of the street because you're going to feel ashamed of not fulfilling your agreement. And he became calmer and he said, so what other possibilities do I have? I said, well, try this. You drive the truck back to the dealer. I'll follow you. You walk in and you say, I can't do it right now. Sorry. And you give him the keys. I'll give you a ride home. Next time you're in town, you see the dealer. You say, good morning. He says, hey, how's it going? You retain your dignity. OK. So he drove the truck back. I'm driving him home. Now remember, a few minutes earlier, he was willing to take my life, right? <laughs> and we're driving home, and he says to me, you know what? If you ever need somebody to drive one of these trucks, swing by. I'll be happy to drive the truck for you. 
Now, he was my adversary, and now he's going to be my, my temp, my part-time worker. Are you kidding me? See what I mean? When he stopped perceiving me to be a persuader who was trying to talk him into something or a manipulator who was trying to make him do something, all of a sudden he started looking at me as a partner in problem solving, and there was no longer any tension between us. And when the tension went away, communication would flow. Cooperation would flow. Abundance will follow. That's how it works. So what are you paid to do? Seriously, what are you paid to do? I think most people don't really think about that enough. You know, what you're paid to do is a whole lot more than the function of what you do. I believe we're paid to create the effect that our function exists for. Does that make sense? We're paid to create the effect. This is Michael. This is in uh, a city outside of Shanghai last year. And I was coaching Michael on a speech competition that was coming up. But even though I wasn't being paid in that specific instance, what my job was, was not to teach Mike or Michael speaking techniques. It was to help him develop the confidence to do what he did well. And I did that by teaching him techniques. And he won his competition. So the purpose of what we do is to make life better for those we do it for. And I believe everyone in every one of our organizations ought to be able to answer that question that way. What's the purpose of what you do? Well, I'm a salesman. What's the purpose of what you do? Make sales. No, it's a function. That's a process. What's the purpose of it? Generate revenue. No, that's a byproduct. What's the purpose of it? I don't know. That's what most of them say. What's the purpose of selling? To make life better for people. If you're selling remotes for a slideshow, if it works, you've made their life better. But it wasn't about the revenue and it wasn't about the product. It was about a smooth slideshow. So it's always about the effect, the outcome. That's what we're paid to do. So when you face your microphones, what do you think your job is? By the way, this is a terrifying sight to some people. How many of you consider speaking in front of a group pretty daunting? Several of you do. And there were times when I did as well. But the only time we get nervous is when we're thinking about us. So if you ever step up to a microphone and you're nervous, just let that be an alarm that says to you, stop thinking about yourself. Why are you here? What's the purpose of the speech? Talk about how they can use the ideas, not worry about how you're going to deliver it. Think about their receipt of and application of the ideas, and the nervousness goes away. When you, well, it's like you heard earlier in the video. Homeless? Homeless for 30 days? What do you do? You know, going out with no resources and no place to stay, no food to eat. What do you do? Help people. Why? Because everybody loves to be helped and everybody needs help on some level at some time. And the more we do that, the less selfish we are and the more selfless we become and the more they want to be around us even more. What's the quickest way to be appreciated by generous people? Be the most grateful recipient they've ever seen. Not with constant, oh gosh, thank you so much. Oh, you, oh, thank you. Not that. A little of that goes a long way. But be grateful in that you acknowledge the value of what you got. You're respectful of the time and energy it took from the other person. And you use the idea or the, the, whatever it was respectfully and well. Do that you'll be the kind of grateful person other people just want to give more to. What kind of speaker do you need to be? If you're going to be a professional speaker, what kind of speaker do you need to be to attract the future you desire? Now, you can replace speaker with any word you want. What kind of a blank do you need to be to attract the future you desire? Remember what I started with? 
The person you become determines what you attract. So focus on becoming the person that's suited for what you want to attract and be worth the trip for whatever that is that's coming toward you. Emerge from that acorn triumphantly and constantly grow. When I wrote the book, The Acorn Principle, I'd spent nine years in psychological research with a team of people over in Arizona who were connected with Arizona State University's psychological testing service. And I wrote the book, The Acorn Principle, and the basic idea of it is your fastest advancement will always come from what you've already got. You already have the qualities you need. Just cultivate and advance those. Nurture your nature. Ten biggest mistakes speakers make, trying to get an A. They're still trying to please a teacher that long since passed, right? Thinking it's about the speech, it's not. It's about what they can do with the message. Thinking the rest of the meeting's less important than your moment, uh-uh. You're just help. You're, you're a temp who's on there for your time, right? Turning the speech into a sales pitch so that they're not getting value, they're just being urged to buy something. One thing you'll notice about Dix and Nanton, when they are making a, an offer to you of something, they've already paid in advance by giving you value first. Some meetings you go to, it's all sales pitch all day long. Here, if there's something they're selling, first they give value. And then they say, if you want more of that, come with us. If not, this is irrelevant for you. Next, here's some more value, right? Okay, waiting until the speech to check the AV. Is this on? Can you hear me in the back? No, but how unprofessional of you, right? Completely unprofessional. Leaving the setup entirely to others. I've been in meeting rooms where I was the highly paid out of town expert, came in and the room was set up wrong. The housekeeping staff was busy doing something else. I have locked the meeting room doors, removed my shirt, reset the entire room, went in the restroom, freshened up, put the shirt and tie back on, unlocked the door, hey, welcome to the meeting, and never said a word about it to them. You think, well, that's not your job. Well, the heck it wasn't. The success of that meeting depended on the meeting room being set up in the right way, and I was the only one there to do it. Using a curriculum vitae instead of an introduction. All you want to do is say, here's why this speaker should be speaking on this topic today to this audience. Here he or she is, right? Not about credentials. Ignoring the importance of humor, the, the famous line is, should, should, I be, should I be funny when I speak? Not unless you want to get paid. <laughs> Focusing on the how to the exclusion of the why. If people don't have a reason to learn something, they won't learn the something. And then not living up to the service commitment. Let me show you what the service commitment is. I send to my clients in advance of a speech this, and it's three pages here. It's not on the document, but it is on slides. Here's what I'll do in preparation for my speech. Here's what I'll do on site and what I will never do. I will tell you the truth 100% of the time. I'll never disclose information that you don't want shared. During my speech, I won't use off-color language, I won't be rude to an audience member or abuse my assignment. And after the presentation, I'll stay around, I'll be available to the people, I'll be respectful and so forth, talk about follow-through, and I will never disclose sensitive information. So, see, when we're up here, we're not here alone. Everybody out there wants us to do well. Every one of them pulling for you. They want this to be the best speech they've heard today. So try your best to be the person they're hoping you are. Two types of preparation for a presentation. One is the message, and that's where most people focus. But you've got to prepare the messenger. You've got to be ready to knock it out of the park. Because if you're not ready, it doesn't matter how good the material is or how great the slides are. A lot of people use old school thinking with new technology. A Little bit of a problem there, okay? See, the old school is thinking of public speeches about the presentation, focusing on the content, using a more formal style, 
having data as your main uh, meat, doing topic research but not audience research, whereas professional speaking is all about outcomes, how you can use this, you know, where you can apply it, and validating it and, and really talking to people, not just delivering content. In a meeting, these are the moving parts. Now, I know I'm doing information overload. That's intentional. I want you to notice lots of moving parts so that whatever thing you decide later to focus on, you know how to drill down even better. In a meeting, you've got the messenger, you or me, the message, the way you deliver it, the audience, what mix of audience, which ones you're really talking to, the setting and the way you control the setting, the process you lead people through, and the resources you use or make available to them. All of those are within your grasp at some level. You can control every one of those variables a little, okay? So what this means to you, and by the way, that is a power statement. What this means to you is, the more often we use that, the more we think about them, not us. So if you're selling, when you get into your pitch, your presentation, just insert this a lot. So we have 15 of these, and they're all moving parts, and they link together in the background with this master panel. And the, Oh, what this means to you is that all the pieces are in place, but it's flexible, and you can use it in a thousand different ways. And with the master panel, what that means to you is you or somebody else can completely control it. Ah, oh, I'll take it. See what I mean? Think about how people learn. Some people mumble to themselves, some doodle, some take detailed notes. You know, there are lots of ways that people process information. So the way we deliver information ought to be flexible too. So that we use all kinds of combinations of tools to get the information across. Not just during the speech, but in the email afterwards and the other conversations as well. In the National Speakers Association, we break all of our professional education into four categories, and each one of those takes one of the many aspects of having a practice as a professional speaker and author and drills down on it. So there are lots of ways to apply this. This I call the daily question. How would the person I intend to become do this work? How would that person show up at this meeting? How would that person interact with other people? How would that person fulfill their responsibilities? Tell you a quick story, and we're coming in for a landing, okay? Mike Vance passed away a few years ago, and we lost a great talent in losing him. But Mike Vance worked as the first president, the creator, co-creator, of Walt Disney University. And Mike was a creative thinking expert, and he's the guy who came up with this, the phrase, think outside the box. You remember the little dots, and you draw the straight lines, and it, you, know, you can only do it four lines? And they say, no, that can't be done. No, you got to get outside the box. What box? There is no box. It's just dots on a page. Well, that's, he came up with that. Mike Vance told me this story. He said, one morning, I was in Anaheim, and I had arrived early, and it was raining. And that's rare in Anaheim. So I parked my car, and I'm standing under a little awning, and Walt Disney drove in. I said, hey, Walt. He said, hey, Mike, wait for me. So he parked his car, and he came over, and he said, Mike, it's raining. And Mike said, yes, sir, I, yeah, I, I got that. He said, don't you understand? Rain is something you get out into. Really? He said, no, come on, Mike, let's walk in the rain. Now, they're at Disneyland, for heaven's sakes, happiest place on earth. So it's before hours. You know, the park's not open. So Walt Disney and Mike Vance go walking in the rain, and they're going down Main Street, splashing in puddles, and they're behaving like a couple of seven-year-olds, right? Having a ball, talking, and just enjoying life. They stop in front of a bay window on one of those stores on Main Street, and Walt said, Mike, he said, look at this window with the rain running down. Do you remember when you were a kid sitting inside a window like that 
and looking out at the rain? Yep, I do. Do you remember as you sat there thinking, boy, you wait till I get to be a grown up, what I'm going to do? And Mike laughed and said, yes, I do remember that. And Walt said, you know what's nice? What? What's nice, Mike, is to be grown ups like we are. Remember the kid we were back then. And to know that we have become the person that little child hoped and dreamed someday we might become. He said, wow, wow, that's powerful. Walt said, yeah, it's important. You know what it's called? No, it's called fulfillment. It's where you become, I'm paraphrasing now, where you become what you were designed to be. You fulfill the promise of the seed in you. What Walt Disney said to Mike was, I hope you always have the kind of thinking that will cause you to be the sort of person that as a child you hoped and dreamed someday you might become. Isn't that a beautiful story? Wow, I love that. So that's just, I put that on the end of the slide presentation so you'd have a reminder of it for when you're looking at it later. As you walk into the sunset and you're thinking about how you're going to apply some of these things, that's what it's going to look like when you get there. I want you to remember that when you were here today, you heard probably more wisdom packed into one day than you're likely to hear at another event in most of your lifetime. And any one of these little concepts, if you just apply that one fervently, can absolutely transform your life. Here's the one I'd like to emphasize. This one is, if it's a goal, then you don't know how to achieve it yet. If you know how to achieve it, it's a to-do. Just do it. Set goals that inspire you to grow and to never stop growing. And Nick, would you come join me on stage, please? Talking about growth, I want to share something with you. You know, my company logo's the acorn. Well, I have an acorn for you. Let me tell you about it, though. Put this in your hand. This acorn, if you can see it, is a little pewter acorn carved by a jeweler. And an acorn has three parts. Stem, cap, seed. Past, present, future. So the stem represents all the people in your line, genetically, who ever existed, all the way back to the beginning of time. You carry their imprint today. I mean, good, bad, and ugly, right? So you've got that imprint in you. The cap holds onto the seed till it's ready to grow on its own. So that's your parents, your role models, your mentors, your heroes. And the seed contains the potential that still lives within you, but also it contains that potential that will be felt through the stem into acorns throughout all time. So nurture your nature. Thanks for having me here. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.